Our next speaker today <laughs> is Mike Van Dyke. Uh, he's the Branch Chief of Environmental Epidemiology and Occupational Health and Toxicology at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. He's going to discuss assessment of potential public health effects from oil and gas operations in Colorado. With that, please give a warm welcome to Mike Van Dyke. All right, can everybody hear me okay? No? Better? All right, I didn't know I was going to have to move furniture and be part AV guy up before I started. So I would just like to thank uh, Mesa University, Garfield County, Kirby for having, it, for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be able to finally come to this talk, to this location and give a talk. I also want to say that without reservation, last night was the best stakeholder meeting that I have ever been to. So if they only were all like that, right? So since my boss has left, I can tell you guys all a secret. And th that secret is that, that I have the best job in the world. I have a job where I have a staff of wonderful scientists who look at data to answer questions that are important to Colorado citizens. And then they give that data to me, and I get to come up here and talk about it. So most of the time, the talking about it part is the fun part. Sometimes not so much fun, uh, but hopefully today is going to be one of those fun times. So really I have two major goals today before I get you guys to lunch. The first goal is to make sure that you guys know about our oil and gas health information and response program. That is the hotline program that people talked about. That is a, a task force recommendation. At the end of my slides there will be a number for citizens to call. We want any citizen who has a health concern to report it to that place. We want to have a centralized place where we get all the health concerns so we know how many are out there and we know what kind of health concerns there are. Second, and what's going to cover most of my slides, is I'm going to tell you about a current report that we released a couple months ago. Um, this was a report that was requested by the Oil and Gas Task Force. The Oil and Gas Task Force asked us to make conclusions on oil and gas and health using available data. Okay. What our goal was, was really to use standardized, transparent, and unbiased scientific methods to come up with a, a conclusion of what the current scientific data says. Um, what I don't want to happen today, I don't want you guys to leave here and think that CDPHE is dismissive of any sort of health concerns that may exist around oil and gas sites. So this was a bad idea, hold on. If I remove my phone from the same pocket as a microphone, I'll be good. Um, I don't want you to think we're dismissive. Uh, I want you to come away from here knowing what we think the current data says and also knowing that CDPHE is doing a lot right now to try and fill the data gaps that exist. Okay? So with that, just a little bit so you know where our program resides. Um, as many state agencies, CDPHE is a really big place. We have about 1,200 employees. There's really about three different programs that interface with oil and gas. We have our oil and gas team, which is in our stationary sources program. These are the people that do oil and gas emissions compliance. Uh, we have our technical services program, and those are the people that run the mobile air quality monitoring unit, and those are the people that monitor regional air quality. And then you have the program that I represent, which is the oil and gas health information response program. And this program is really responsible for the response line and a scientific review. In addition, what this program tries to do is when there is a health concern, we try to coordinate across our entire agency as well as with other agencies to really try and address that concern. So, I usually give this talk to citizens and I talk about how exposures occur and I think most people know how exposures occur. I mean, venting tanks, leaking tanks, drilling fracking equipment, traffic flares are all sources of exposure. All of these are regulated by CDPHE or COGCC. And yes, there are many hazardous substances emitted from oil and gas. 
there are cancer-causing substances, there are toxic substances. We did a review, as part of our review, we looked and we found 62 substances that we said were associated with oil and gas emissions. And each one of these things can be a health concern at some level of exposure. And the health concerns vary. I mean, it could be kidney effects, neurological effects, respiratory effects, lots of different effects. Um, importantly, most of these, if not all of them, also have other sources other than oil and gas. But really where I think the important, the important point lies is that the effects from exposure, the effects from these chemicals really depend on the level of exposure. How many people were around in, it must have been early 80s, uh, when they started talking about saccharin? Anybody remember saccharin? When they got rid of your tab cola? Um, well, saccharin, they found that saccharin caused bladder tumors in laboratory animals. It was a carcinogen. And a lot of regulatory action happened, a lot of company action happened, and they removed this substance from most um, sugary drinks, or not sugary drinks, I should say. And, but science continued. So as the science evolved on this particular topic, what they found was in order to really have these kinds of bladder tumors, people needed to drink upwards of 100 diet sodas a day. Now, I know there are a few people that might drink that many, but not very many. So later on what they found, more science again, was that this particular kind of tumor in the rat bladder really had no human relevance. Humans would not get that same kind of tumor. So the reason I point out something about saccharin in a talk about oil and gas is really for two reasons. First of all, to say all of this stuff all of these health effects depend on the level of exposure. And secondarily, science evolves over time. So whatever answer we have today may change somewhat next week. So all of the getting back to oil and gas, um, all of these 62 chemicals that we talked about from the previous slide, they all have health-based exposure guidelines that are established by EPA and other state agencies. Um, these guidelines that have been established really reside, rely on conservative methods to ensure that sensitive individuals are protected. What that means is they've set these values really low in order to protect the public. Okay? So these are good values to compare exposures against. So getting into what we did in our report, we did two things. First, we looked at these exposures, given the data that we have from these chemicals around oil and gas. And second, we looked at all the scientific articles that have been published around oil and gas and health. Okay? We use that to really try and answer the question there in the orange box at the bottom. Do substances emitted into the air from oil and gas activities result in exposures to coloradans at levels that may be harmful to their health? So, I, I mean, in my mind, that's the primary question we're trying to answer. That's the primary question that citizens have. So, the first part of this was a health risk assessment. So, we identified these 62 substances. We went out and we found every piece of air monitoring data that we could find on these 62 substances. That was things that was published in literature. That was things collected as part of another evaluation. That was data collected in Garfield County. That was, that was data collected as part of the FRAP-A study. So really we found every data source that we could. This resulted in about 10,000 individual air measurements that really represent the distance of about 500 feet to a quarter mile from an active oil and gas well. Okay. This covered 2008 to 2016, so it was relevant for the current time period. And we really tried to divide this into short-term exposures and long-term exposures, and really using conservative assumptions to, to really call those. And for a short-term exposure, we had the maximum single sample for each of these chemicals from the 10,000 measurements. For the long-term exposure, we took the maximum average value from the 33 sites. And really what we wanted to do with these values was compare these and figure out, compare these with those guidelines I just told you about. 
and say, are these exposures above or below what we're calling safe levels? Okay, does that make sense so far? All right, so this is a really, I expect you guys to be able to read everything on that chart. Can you do that? All right, so this is really the key to it all. So along the bottom here, can you guys see that mouse or not? All right, along the bottom here are those 62 chemicals, okay? Each one of those bars is one of those 62 chemicals. What we did is we took that exposure value and we divided it by the health guideline, okay? So what that means, if it is over one, that means that exposure is above the health guideline, right? If it's below one, it's below the health guideline. So what we can see here is nearly all of these chemicals, up to about right here, were below, were, were about 10% or less of the health guideline. So really low exposures. We had a few up here, kind of in the 10% the to 40% range of the health-based guideline. So what we could say based on this is, you know, the risk that we see based on the data that's available from long-term exposure appears to be pretty low. That's what this says. Now, when we look at these things, we look at non-cancer effects, and this is non-cancer effects, and we look at cancer risk. Okay? Only a few of these are really known carcinogens. And really, the driver of most of this, as everybody knows, is benzene. Okay? So when we look at cancer risk, we have EPA has established what they call an acceptable cancer risk range. And what that means is the acceptable range is no more than 1 in 10,000 additional cases of cancer due to this exposure. That's the top of the acceptable risk range. Now, just to put that in perspective, does anybody know your risk of cancer in your lifetime? Anybody want to guess? One in three. Each individual's risk of cancer in their lifetime is about one in three. And so this is one in 10,000. So, you know, I can't tell you what's acceptable for you or not, but this is what EPA says is acceptable, okay? Uh, and really what we found was all of the exposures to the carcinogens in oil and gas were within the acceptable range based on the data that we had. So the next part of our review was our systematic scientific literature review. So for this part of the review, we really wanted to do, we really wanted to look at all the studies that have been published out there around oil and gas and health effects. People have heard about oil and gas and leukemia, oil and gas and asthma, oil and gas and um, adverse birth outcomes. You guys have all heard of those studies, right? So we wanted to take all of those studies and put them together in one place and review those in a really systematic way where we rated the quality of those articles in the same way. This is something that we do for lots of topics. There are standardized scientific ways of doing these things. We do this for marijuana every day when new studies come out about marijuana. We now do this for oil and gas every day when new studies come out about oil and gas. Um, I want to say if you go and look in the scientific literature, you will see hundreds of citations that say oil and gas and health. Okay? If you start to look closer, you will find a total of 12 studies where there's been an actual measurement of an exposure and an actual measurement of an outcome. So there's been a lot of writing, but not a lot of studying. Um, we reviewed all of those 12 studies, and that included 27 health effects, and we really rated them as, you know, substantial, moderate, limited, mixed, or insufficient evidence. And not to belabor it too much, this is really the summary table of what we found. And again, there are not very many studies out there. And the studies that are out there, while they're not bad studies, they would be called low quality scientific information because there's a huge number of limitations in most of these studies. So what I can say, objectively speaking, using standardized methods, that we really don't have anything above limited evidence 
that a particular health outcome is associated with exposure to oil and gas. And that one is respiratory effects. All of the others are kind of mixed or insufficient. So this, this report, really our, our major conclusions were, based on the currently available air monitoring data, the risk of harmful health effects is low. And you notice I didn't say there is no risk. I said low risk. For residents living at distances 500 feet or greater from oil and gas operations. Uh, we also said that studies of populations living near oil and gas operations provide limited evidence of the possibility for harmful health effects. And this really needs to be confirmed with more studies. Unfortunately, in order to really determine whether a study is true or not, it needs to be repeated. And most of these studies have not been repeated. Okay? So I want to say those are our two major conclusions. What are we doing? We have this health concern hotline. Um, you can get all the information you want about this hotline if you just go to colorado.gov slash oghealth. Um, really our goals for this is to make sure we integrate a response across the entire department and hopefully across multiple agencies. We also want to analyze trends of health concerns. Um, where necessary, we want to do site investigations to figure out what's occurring on these sites and why are we getting these concerns. In some instances, we are doing air monitoring around these sites. And in addition, this website really serves as the information clearinghouse. All of the information on oil and gas that CDPHE has is on this website. And then we also have our, as Dr. Wolf talked about, our mobile air quality laboratory. This is a, a huge step forward in what CDPHE can do around measuring emissions, well, not measuring exposures around oil and gas, I should say. Uh, this thing measures 55 different VOCs, it measures particulate matter, has meteorology data, it has a GPS. Um, this is what it looks like up there in the corner, this fancy little trailer, and this is what it looks like inside. This thing can be deployed for several days at a time. It has its own power source, it has a diesel generator, uh, and we have recently, it recently completed its first deployment and is ready for its second deployment next week. So just so everybody doesn't get confused, what I've been talking about so far has been a report that was requested by the Oil and Gas Task Force. The Oil and Gas Task Force also requested a second thing. The second thing was a comprehensive risk <coughs> assessment using the emission data from the CSU studies. What I've been talking about so far did not use the CSU study data. And the reason for that is CSU collected emissions data. Emissions data needs to be put into computer models to come up with exposure data. So that's what we're in the process of doing right now. Um, CDPHE has a third party contractor and we have started this risk assessment. Uh, we are really going to do dispersion model based exposures and I think this is going to be the best data that we have to date. This is going to eliminate a lot of the uncertainties that we have with our current data because we're going to be able to calculate potential health risk by distance from a site, by operation, and most importantly, the emissions we're measuring here are directly attributable to oil and gas activities. This is not highway emissions. This is not emissions from other, some other site. This is oil and gas. So we expect to complete that next summer. And then if you guys do want that new report of the stuff I've been talking about today, that's also on our OG Health website. And, and right here I do want to say, you know, they let me come up here to try and talk about these things. But really the true people that have done this report are sitting over here, Allie, Allie Bamber and Tammy McMullen. And they are the prime authors of this report. They just make me answer the questions. So if you really have the hard questions, save them for them later. So. I don't know how I did to get us back on schedule. You did very well. All right. So I think I have time for questions. Are we doing microphones or? There's one in the front here. So I'm the Garfield County Commissioner. My question is on your hotline. And I, just in my limited public meetings. Can you public meetings. for everybody? I'm a Garfield County Commissioner, and in my limited public meetings, I've, I've heard a lot of crazy things from, uh, and I, uh, 
MD from doctor being an MD from Aspen being in a meeting in Battlement Mesa and mm -hmm. scaring everybody half to death. And then they asked him, well, what, what would be your, uh, what would you do if you lived here? And he said, everybody should move out of Battlement Mesa. I, somehow I'm on a, a email list where I get this endocrine, endro and stuff all the time about those somebody's got something going on with that um, we've had we've had the a, a, a doctor's office in Glenwood Springs called the CDPHE about birth defects which was really had nothing to do with the oil patch per se I forget we got a I've been in a meeting where a, a farmer is talking about two-headed goats and everything caused by um, oil and gas issues and so if you have a hotline I would think you're getting a lot of those those same questions that are that are just kind of off the off the charts or off the wall so we are getting a lot of those kinds of questions and a lot of those is really just providing accurate information to people to make sure they know I mean this is what we know right now um, but the other thing that I didn't mention that this staff does is we also are willing to answer questions from legislators and policymakers I mean to the best of our ability try and help come up with a a reasonable answer to those sorts of things so we have staff available to help with that too uh, but we definitely get those same kind of questions um, now, I will say, unfortunately, well, I don't know if it's fortunately or unfortunately, um, people in Garfield County have Kirby to call. So <laughs> we want to hear about those health concerns, too. We haven't heard a lot from Garfield County, and whether that's not much is going on over here at the moment, or whether they have other avenues to really lodge those concerns, um, I don't know. But we want to hear those because I want to be able to say five years from now, that we average X number of health concerns across the state per year. I want a real number on that because we've never had a real number on that. So I would really encourage people to tell people about our hotline and tell people to call us. So thank you. You spoke of mission data in the CSU study versus some what other... We used? I'm sorry? Versus what we used. Yeah, and I'm not sure what you call that kind of data. Can you explain the difference between what is mission data, what is what you use? Yeah, no, I can't. So the, the measurements that we have available right now are measurements of air concentrations at various locations around an oil and gas site. It could be from uh, a Garfield County monitor that's close to oil and gas. It could be from a Platteville site that's close to oil and gas. It could be from a study that measures it close to oil and gas. But it's concentration of that contaminant in air. Um, the difference is, is what CSU did is they measured how much of that contaminant um, the site is emitting. And it's usually in pounds or some sort of unit of weight. And that needs to be translated to a concentration at a particular location through a dispersion model. So it, that data needs to be modeled in order to come up with what is the concentration for somebody standing 500 feet away. So I don't know if that helps, but we could try again. There's been studies of oil field workers, um, but I would say overall, it's been an understudied population. Um, they, there hasn't been a lot published on that. So, I mean, there is some data. And those people are obviously exposed at the highest levels. So I would love to see more data from occupational exposures. I am occupational health too, so I like that stuff too. Microphone. Yes, sir. I got, I got a question real quick. Oh. So I appreciate the data that you brought forward. I think that's very informative in terms of what I would call the indirect impacts of oil and gas in the environment. Oh. But my question is, is did that uh, study include the direct impacts, those that are actually doing the work, those that are exposed to oil and gas on a daily basis? Did that, was that included in that data? No, no. The focus of this study was on people living in vicinity to oil and gas activities. It was not on occupational populations. 
The uh, original companies that participated in the CSU phase one study are all in the room today and, and we're proud that they stepped up to do that. But we were also a few days ago um, talking about how when we look back at those original studies as an industry here in Garfield County, many of the, the processes and technologies used even five years ago are not being used today. For example, um, how they conducted flowback then looks nothing like what they're doing now. Mm -hmm. And while it is the best data available, how does the how will the health assessment or how does the agency generally try to account for technology outpacing even our best efforts to keep up with what these risks are? And and will, do you envision something like this where you are able to express relative risk in relation to things like the technological advancements that happen on a yearly basis, let alone? You know, decades. I don't. I don't know if that's a. There's a question in there somewhere. But. <laughs> <laughs> so what I can say is that we really can't account for those things very well. I mean, the data that we have are the data that we have. Um, and generally, when we're doing a risk assessment, what we're trying to we're trying to estimate more of an upper end or a worst case exposure. So what I could say is that. If the results come back that there is some risk, you know, we, start, we will talk about what those technological changes have been. But if the results come back and they say low risk, you know, we know we're, we're confident that those are worse than are occurring today. Does that make sense? So I, I think it does make a difference. It's difficult to, uh, to control for that in what we're doing, uh, but we definitely think about that. Hey, Mike, Mike McHugh with Karis. Um, you mentioned that you compared the concentrations to health-based guidelines and it's not an occupational survey. No. So I was just curious if you could speak to what health-based guidelines those are. So in general, the health-based guidelines that we used were from EPA. Hmm. Um, there were some instances where there's not a health-based guideline that EPA has developed. In that instance, we went to another state that may have developed it. It could have been California, it could have been Texas that developed that. It's outlined in our, in our report where all those values came from, Great. but those are general population exposure values. Those are not worker exposure values. Good deal. And generally speaking, are any of those values, in, in your opinion, kind of like the saccharin where you'd have to drink about 100 of those things uh, with that substance in it to really have a risk? or? I think that's hard to say right now. I mean, they're constantly evolving over time. Um, and some of the cancer numbers are tough because there's different ways to analyze for cancer. And there's a standardized way and there's other ways that people are proposed. So we've generally used conservative methods wherever possible uh, to make sure we're protective of public health. So Sounds great. Thank you. Just Did we have one more question? Yes, sir. Just a, a kind of a comment. My name is Will Fleckenstein from the Colorado School of Mines, and I actually was part of the Air Water Gas Group. Uh, you know, when they're doing the research funded by the NSF. And one of the points I wanted to make was that the research I presented yesterday was that oil wells have very different leakage rates in the subsurface based upon how they're constructed. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you just point at a, a well as a point on a map, one of the problems that previous studies have had is that they've never really examined that relationship between these leakage rates and w when the wells were constructed, how they were constructed. Mm -hmm. And it turns out there's a huge difference between how the wells are constructed, and many times the research couldn't pick up on those differences, which kind of caused some problems with the, with that research. Uh, the second uh, uh, type of issue was that many of these emissions are not associated with wells. They're, they're associated with production facilities, and, and many times that's the most important thing to look at as far as distances to production facilities, et cetera, it, it appears. Yeah, and, and I think for the second piece of that, I mean, that's why we kind of call them activities, because it's a variety of emission sources. Um, for the first piece of that, I assume you're talking about levels of these things in water, not necessarily air, right? And I will say, just to be very clear, this, what we did, is all about air. We prioritize looking at air first because every oil and gas site has air emissions. Um, I don't think that's the case for water. So we're really, and more likely to affect public health from an air pathway. 
Uh, just a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, all right, so you're going to end up with uh, exposure data uh -huh. that you're going to refine. Will you then take that data and baseline it? Base Basically, it's okay. Exposure uh, proximity to oil well is X. Um, living in proximity to I-25 is Y. Living, uh, living in downtown Lafayette is Z. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're always looking for kind of relative comparisons. Mm -hmm. Relative comparisons are hard. And it's always, especially when you're talking to the public, because the public always wants to say, you know, I chose, left, I chose to live next to I-25, but I didn't choose to live next to this oil well. So it's that whole voluntary versus involuntary. But I, but I think that that is important in order to be able to communicate what the magnitude of these numbers really is. So we are working on some, some better relative data to start to compare this to, yes. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you, Kirby.